All right. Currently recording. Okay, good morning. So this is our first lecture for chapter one. Uh, I apologize if my kids come stampeding in at any point, that is possible. Um, we'll do a lecture at 11 a.m. each day of the week, Monday through Friday, probably for about half an hour, 40 minutes. And that'll just give us a, a regular little dose of things to be thinking about. Oh, there's someone else trying to get in. And so let's start with chapter one and just look at some of the some of the basics. It's a very dry chapter, chapter one, unfortunately. Um, lots of fiddly metric conversions, but we kind of need that before we can do anything else. So when you're browsing on Desire to Learn, you can actually um, make a copy of the lecture notes, which will be in one for each chapter, obviously, in the content section. And usually you have access to a partial portion of the notes because I'm expecting to be teaching in class and people would be filling in the gaps. I need to double check, but I suspect I've probably just given everybody my full version of the notes this semester. I will check that and make sure that that is indeed true. Right, looks like we've got everyone who's coming this morning. <clears throat> so, <laughs> excuse me. One of the things that uh, we normally do with the start of each chapter is just kind of tantalize you with some ideas which the chapter is based on, things that we will eventually be talking about in the chapter. So for instance, a um, couple of scenarios here. Everybody see my screen, yeah? That's the other thing you should be able to see the notes that I'm talking about. So a couple of scenarios, you enter a hospital, you have to start your shift and you have to administer some drugs to some of your patients. 500 milligrams of Milfalan, 250 milligrams of Genevia, 100 milligrams of Zmax. However, the containers measure each of the drug, uh, drugs in grams, not milligrams. How would you convert that into milligrams and what would be the appropriate amount? The courts in both North America and, and Europe are filled with cases where people didn't get enough of a drug or got way too much of a drug because someone couldn't do a simple metric conversion. So it matters in allied healthcare. Later on, you see a medical chart for a patient um, and a urine sample has a specific gravity measured at 1.05. How was this calculated? How do we create a value for the specific gravity? And what would this suggest about the patient? Is this a healthy value for a patient? Is it within acceptable limits? And if it isn't, what might it suggest about the patient's urine and therefore the patient, if they have a value as high or low as this? That's some of the kind of things that we're going to be talking about in this chapter. So first question, what is chemistry? Well, I'm glad you asked. So if we can measure it, if we can um, take a mass, a volume, take its temperature, um, it's something to do with chemistry. All matter concerns chemistry. And the matter and chemicals around us have been divided up into their individual elements. That's matter which has the same kind of atoms. We describe it as being atoms for a particular element. And I'm sure you're no doubt aware of many of these elements already. Things like iron or calcium, which we need for healthy bones. Oxygen, which is needed by the organs in the body. Each of these elements is made up of its own special kinds of atoms. And when we compare the atoms for one element to another, we find that they're different in some important respects. 
there's a lot of crossover. There's a lot of stuff which is similar, but they're unique in some way. Just like everybody you meet, or most people you meet, will have one head, two arms, two legs. Um, there will be subtle differences. Could be hair color, eye color, how tall the person is, how broad the person is. All these things come into play. So although we can all see other human beings as being part of the same species, we can distinguish from one human being to another. And that's kind of how we treat the elements. They're basically the same, and we'll talk about this in chapter two. They almost all have uh, electrons and neutrons and of course protons, but it's a different combination, different numbers, which makes atoms for that particular element unique to that particular element. Now we list the elements in the periodic table, which I can pull up now. In an exam, you'd always be given a copy of the periodic table. You would never be expected to have the periodic table memorized. That's just too mean, even for my standards. So I would suggest um, as a starting point for the semester, if you're familiar with the names and chemical symbols for all the elements in the first four rows of the periodic table, which is what we sometimes call periods, elements across the row, that's a period. Elements up and down in the column are what we sometimes call groups. So if you're familiar with those first 36 elements, that's going to make you familiar with about 95% of the chemistry that we look at over the course of the semester. We will eventually dip down into the lanthanide and actinide systems, um, but those first four rows is enough to be comfortable in this course. Excuse me for one second, I can hear my four-year-old daughter crying out for some attention, so something must be up, excuse me. Zoom recording, and bear with me a second, somebody might be trying to send me a message. Okay, just from earlier, that you can see my screen, good. Okay. Recording continued, okay. So first four rows, or first, for periods, as we call them, is really going to give us the vast majority of elements that we'll talk about during this semester. And even then, you'll never need to have them memorized for an exam. You'll just be given a copy of the periodic table. Okay, and so with all these elements, the 120 or so elements, some of them are disputed because they're so radioactive, so unstable, they all exist literally for seconds before they decompose again. We've got about 120 elements that we agree on in science. And for each of them, they all have their own unique name. If you discover the element, you get to name it, which is why you'll find some elements named after famous scientists. They'll name it after themselves, or people who name it after the famous scientist that they was their hero in life. And we then use a chemical symbol for each of those elements. Now, sometimes we'll use a single letter. Sometimes we'll use maybe two or three letters. So C had been used for carbon. And so for calcium, we use CA. We always know when we're looking at the chemical symbol for another element because we start with a capital again. So if it's two or three letters being used, it's only the first letter which is capitalized. And so when we see a chemical formula, we see the capitals and we see the beginning of a new element in that chemical formula. So these elements can be combined together to make pure compounds, chemical substances which are made up of the elements. But there's only certain combinations which are possible. And we'll look into some of the reasons for that later on in chapters three and four. So sometimes the Lego bits don't fit together. No matter how hard we try, they will never fit together. But when they do, we get something like this display. This must be it. Is it Legoland in South California? I can't remember where I got this from. It looks like it's probably from Legoland or something. Um, when they do fit together, 
we get something which is better than the sum of its individual parts. So some combinations work, some combinations do not. And for a particular compound made up of elements, it's a particular combination of those atoms from those elements. So for example, we have H2O water. When we take two hydrogens in white here or the slightly off gray, and one oxygen, which we normally use red for oxygen in chemistry, and they combine together the oxygen as the go-between for the two hydrogens. So there's a chemical bond there between one hydrogen and the oxygen, and a chemical bond there between the other hydrogen and the same oxygen. H2O, we quite often write the element which is further to the left in the periodic table first, so with hydrogen, there's two hydrogens. And so we get this little subscript telling us how many hydrogens are in a single unit, a single molecule. And then for the oxygen, there's only one. And if there's only one atom in the molecule, we don't have to number that. So if you don't see a number for the number of atoms for that element, assume it's just one. So H2O for water. Water can combine with a compound like sodium chloride to form a saline solution. Sodium atoms and chloride atoms join together and we get sodium chloride. And we always show the simplest form of the formula. For every sodium, there's one chlorine atom. And so the sodium and chlorine, sodium chloride, dissolve in water to make saline, saline solution. And that's what's often administered to in patients when they're on an IV drip. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to talk about, talk about? So we've got our elements, which are the simplest form of matter that can't normally be broken down, certainly can't be broken down by chemical reaction. But we combine the elements to make these compounds, and we can have a pure compound made up of elements but it can be broken down by chemical reactions. However, sometimes the elements combine just to give a mixture. So we haven't formed a new chemical compound. We've just got a bunch of chemicals kind of uh, living or mixing together to form that mixture or solution. So for example, oxygen is an element and that's atoms with a very particular setup and structure inside to make up atoms of oxygen. We know it's an element because it's part of the periodic table. If it's an element, you can find it on the periodic table. But then we get compounds like carbon dioxide, CO2, although I didn't write that in the formula there for some reason, CO2 with one carbon and two oxygens each time, this is a combination of the elements to make a new compound. But then the air around us that we breathe isn't a compound or an element, it's actually a mixture. Most of that mixture is nitrogen gas, about 80%. Then next we've got oxygen gas, about 20%. And then carbon dioxide, about 0.2, maybe 0.3% and a little bits of other gases mixed in like argon as well. But the main consistently seen chemicals in the air as a mixture, but they still retain their own individual formulas. They're just kind of partying together. So with these mixtures, they don't have a fixed chemical formula. For example, if we were in a classroom on campus, and you measured the amount of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide at the beginning of the class and compared it to the amount of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide at the end of the class, because of respiration in our bodies, the oxygen level would probably have gone down a little bit because we're using it up, and the carbon dioxide would probably have increased a little bit because we are producing it and exhaling it out. So these mixtures of solutions don't have a fixed composition. It can vary depending on where you are and what you add to the mixture. Also, these mixtures can be separated using, using their different physical properties. 
you can't separate a pure compound. You can chemically change it by chemical reactions, but you can't use filtration or solubility to filter out one carbon dioxide molecule from another carbon dioxide molecule. But with mixtures, so something like copper and iron, iron of course is magnetic, copper is not. So you could drag a magnet over the iron copper mixture and it would pick up the iron and leave you with copper on the table. The copper would not be attracted to the magnet. A mixture of water and salt or saline solution, you could use the boiling temperature of water, 100 degrees Celsius, to boil off the water and leave you with a, a beaker of salt. Sand and water, sand isn't soluble in water, and so you could just use a piece of filter cloth and filter off that sand from the water, drain it off. Oil and water, as we'll talk about later, they're not miscible, they don't like each other, so they separate in the beaker according to density. Less dense things rise to the top, more dense things sink to the bottom when they don't like each other or are immiscible. And so the oil could be just about scooped off the top surface uh, in an oil and water mixture. Okay, any questions or thoughts at this point? Are we doing okay? Oh, I hear my daughter again. Tell you what, let's take a five minute break. I'll see what crisis has befallen her mermaid this time. So let's take five minutes. So if people need the bathroom or want to take a drink, I'll be back shortly. Oh, there's someone else joining us. One thing to add, by the way, I just get so excited by the chemistry. If you're trying to get into the lecture and you don't seem to be getting let in because we've already started or because I'm just really old, and miss it, don't be afraid to send me a text message on my phone, which is normally close by, although my daughter has it just now. It's normally close by, and if I see that text message, I will add you in. 618-364-5546. It's in the syllabus. Let's take a break for five, and then we'll do maybe an extra 10 or 15 minutes. And I remember to pause. So again, no labs this week, first labs next week, experiment one. And you can find the lab packet for experiment one on desire to learn in the experiments folder. Okay. So we of course talked about looking for the elements in the periodic table. And the design of the periodic table is no mistake there's a very particular order for all of the elements in the table. Now, Mendeleev, Dmitry Mendeleev, the brilliant Russian chemist many years ago, first came up with the periodic table by taking elements he could find and reacting them with a common set of chemicals and observing the chemical response, the reaction that each of the other elements had with those chemicals. So starting with hydrogen, then moving on to helium, and then lithium, beryllium, etc. For all the elements he had, and he certainly didn't have all of them, he would just go through them one by one. He started by working through them by mass, although today we now think of them more correctly by atomic number, which we'll talk about in chapter two, the number of protons. And he just went through them. And every time he found an element, that reacted in a similar way as hydrogen had reacted, he would start a new row, a new period of his periodic table. Go through the elements again, then finally he had sodium, which reacts in a similar way to hydrogen and lithium after it. And so he starts a new, a new row, works through, gets to potassium, it's similar to hydrogen again, so works through the elements again and so on and so forth. And so as he built up that periodic table, it wasn't just that hydrogen was similar to lithium, which was similar to sodium, which was similar to potassium and rubidium, etc. He found that any of the columns of elements he had made up 
almost always contained elements which were similar to each other. That's certainly true and for the very last column, the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, xenon, etc. These elements are all similar to each other because of the fact that they are so unreactive. And we'll talk more about this in chapter two. There are very special, specific reasons for elements in the same column being similar in their chemical reactivity. But we need to delve into the subatomic particles to understand why that is. And that's a bit more than we want to look at today. Just take it for now that if you're looking for an element that's like magnesium, we'd look for elements above it or below it in the same column, in the same group. We also have some basic trends in the periodic table as well. And one of the most basic trends is that for any particular row, we normally start with a metal shown in red. And by the time we get to the end of that row, we have normally hit a non-metal in the periodic table. And there's a divide, as you can see here, between the metals and non-metals. Get my pen here. Is it going to work today? This divide. Oh, look at that. It's working. This divide in the table with elements that we call metalloids. We actually hit most of them if we start with boron in the top left corner of the right hand block. And we slide down to the right diagonally. We hit the majority of these metalloids. And add on to that germanium and antimony and then hydrogen, which is a non-metal, but everything else to the left of that divide is a metal, and everything to the right of that divide is a non-metal. As you would expect, metals normally have a luster, have a high melting point and a high boiling point, conduct electricity. These are some of the things which define metal-like uh, character, whereas non-metals tend to be opposites. They have low melting points. They have low boiling points. Quite often so low, there are actually liquids or uh, gases at room temperature. Uh, they tend to be bad conductors and they tend to not conduct heat energy either. Let me just clear my screen. And the metalloids are therefore elements which have a little bit of both. They have some properties like a metal, but they also have some properties like a non-metal. And these are the metalloids of the table. We'll talk more about them and these chemical trends in chapter two. Each box in the periodic table gives you some basic information for that element. For example, you get the chemical symbol for the element, one to three letters. You'll also get the atomic number which is how we count through the elements in the table. And that's a unique number for each element. No two elements have the same atomic number because no two elements have the same number of protons inside the atom. Then underneath is what we call the atomic mass unit, the mass using our arbitrary scale. And you'll see just as the atomic numbers increase as we move across and down the table, the atomic mass increases as we move across and down the table. But it's not uniform. We can see elements with the same mass, but we'll never see two elements with the same atomic number. The atomic number is absolutely unique to atoms of that particular element. So as we had alluded to earlier, for chemical compounds, it's a very particular combination of elements, like carbon dioxide, one carbon with two oxygens. Interestingly, oxygen is what we call a diatomic gas. It likes to hang out with another oxygen to make a molecule. It doesn't like to be on its own, it's always looking for a partner. So chemically, it forms its own little unique molecule or units of oxygen gas. A carbon comes flying in and sticks itself in between the two oxygens to form carbon dioxide. 
So there's always one carbon and two oxygens to make carbon dioxide, as we said. But sometimes we can play around with the formula to make a different chemical font compound. For instance, if we increase the amount of carbon or decrease the amount of oxygen, we can get carbon monoxide. Now, one carbon, one oxygen, different formula, different combination of those elements, so it's a different and unique chemical compound. We, we need oxygen to live. Carbon monoxide is a poison and will kill us eventually. So different formulas mean a different chemical compound, uh, very different chemical properties for these different compounds. Now, of course, quite often we won't be looking at a single molecule or a single uh, unit of a compound. We often have large quantities. And so when we want to list how much of the compound or element we have, how many units, we use numbers at the beginning of the chemical formula. So a coefficient of four telling us that we have one, two, three, four molecules of H2O, water. A number in the front of three telling us we have one, two, three units of carbon dioxide. Formula showing us that it's one carbon and two oxygens per unit. Or nitrogen gas, N2, that's two atoms of nitrogen per unit. And then the two in the front telling us that there's two of those units of nitrogen gas. As we'd said before, we can take pure elements, combine them chemically to make new compounds with a distinct formula like NaCl for sodium chloride. But then we can mix them with, mix them with liquids like water to form a solution. Okay. That, I think, is probably a good point to stop for today. So a fairly simple start. Um, it is a bit of a dry chapter, chapter one. I do apologize. There's just no way around it. We'll go on tomorrow. Let's see what we'll be looking at tomorrow. We'll look at the states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, and the forces of attraction between molecules which dictate what kind of state we have. We'll look at chemical reactions. And we might, yeah, I think we might get into the metric system, which is a big piece for the chapter. Probably do the, a little bit of the metric system tomorrow and maybe again on Friday. Okay. Any questions before people disappear? Everyone's still awake? Maybe? Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Chem Talk video will go up sometime around 12 o'clock ish today. Um, I don't plan on having a um, question of the day video yet. We'll get through some chemistry, through some ideas, and then those questions of the day videos will appear. Basically, Chem Talk videos talk about the theory for the most part, questions of the day talk about a particular problem and using that theory to come up with an answer to the problem. Okay, thanks to everybody who kept me company today. I uh, don't forget my number for texting or email me at dryhotmail.com if I can say it properly. And I'll hopefully see everybody tomorrow. Oh. Where's my thingy? Oh, there it is, hiding. Oh, might be a couple of questions in here. Let's see. Oh, no problem. Thanks, guys. Take care. Wash your hands.